before you, Lord, that you will be glorified. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. The Lord says, where there's two or three gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. It's such a wonderful day to give God praise, glory, and honor, to acknowledge his goodness and mercy bestowed upon us another day, how he graced us with another opportunity to come before his presence with thanksgiving and offer to him the praise from the fruit of our lips magnify the name of the Lord. Such an awesome privilege and a blessing it is to know that God loves us unconditionally. It doesn't matter what you go through in this life. Great is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And God is our valiant warrior who will fight for you. He told us in his word, you need not to fight for God himself will fight for you. And it's such an awesome privilege to know that God is working behind the scenes for our lives for the better. What a glorious God we serve. Amen. We're going to go ahead and get started with our lesson tonight. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Continue. We started last week talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. And this week we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and power after Pentecost Day. The Holy Spirit and power after Pentecost Day. We're going to talk about that today. So I just pray that you're standing firm in the faith of Jesus Christ. No matter what challenges that you encounter, that you're trusting in the ability of God to keep you secure in his presence. Because the Lord is on your side as the reigning king. And he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think as we trust in him. Amen. Tonight I want to talk about Holy Spirit and the power after after Pentecost Day. But what the what is Pentecost? What is Pentecost? Pentecost is a word that means 50. So we're gonna go into a word of prayer, then we're gonna get into our lesson. So gracious God our Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I pray that the word of God will bring inspiration to the hearers who hear this word tonight, oh God, to inspire, to edify. Build them up in their faith, O oh God, that they will grow in grace and knowledge of who you are, that you will be glorified. We ask tonight, O oh God, let the word come forth with clarity and understanding that will help enlighten the people of God who hears this word, even from this day forward, those who may hear this word later on, God, that will make an impact in their hearts and build them up in their faith to trust you all the more, that you will expand their territories, enlarge their borders, God, that you cause them to prosper and be in health as their souls prosper. We bind every demonic attack and assault that will come against because of this word to know, God, that you will have clear access in the airways. The word will go forth with power and authority, God, unhindered and checked by any demonic force. 
that we, Father God would make a change in all of our lives for the better. We give you glory, give you honor, we give you praise, oh God. Remove the business of the day from our minds and our hearts, oh God, that we have clear conscience to focus on you, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, Webster. Thank you for joining. And Rashonda, bless you, bless you, bless you. Hallelujah. Pentecost is a word that means 50. So I want to read something I found and got questions. What is the day of Pentecost? What is the day of Pentecost? Pentecost is significant in both Old and New Testament. Pentecost is actually the Greek name for a festival known in the Old Testament as the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks. In Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15, and this is in the English Standard Version, it says, You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, and from the day that you were brought the sheaf of the wave offering. That sheaf is like a, a, a bundle of grain to offer for the Lord. And then Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 9, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 9, You shall count seven weeks, Begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. The sickle is like the blade that cuts the grain from off of the off, off the uh, the foundation where it is. The Greek word means fifty, and refers to fifty days that have elapsed since the wave offering of Passover. The feast of weeks celebrated in the end of the grain harvest. Most interesting. However, it is used in Joel and chapter in, in Acts, in the book of Acts. Looking back to Joel prophecy, in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32, it says this. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and this is talking about the anointing and I said I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth blood and fire and columns of smoke the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before that great and awesome day of the Lord comes and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved shall be saved for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there should be those who escape, as the Lord said, and among the survivors shall those whom the Lord calls. So it's talking about the end time where Christ is going to return and God was going to pour out his spirit. And this was even referenced to the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts chapter 2 when, when um, they were gathered in the upper room and God poured his spirit out upon all flesh. This is even significant to that type of passage of scripture. And it makes it known to us that the outpouring of the Spirit is going to be great, that people are going to be saved from this outpouring. And this is so amazing because when you get a revelation of the outpouring of God's presence, that anointing, the endowment of the Spirit, it empowers you to do great wonders in the earth. God said, I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth and blood and fire and columns of smoke. And this is God talking about even when Christ is coming back, there's going to be great wonders take place on earth. We're starting to see with the rumors of wars and all different things are taking place. People being murdered and killed all around the country, in our own cities. People being slaughtered. All these different things are, are, are things that have been prophesied that, was, that should come to pass before the coming of the Lord. The Lord is soon to come. And when he comes back again, it's going to be many people, many people who are going to be, be witnesses of this great and awesome day of the Lord when he comes back. And when Christ comes back, will you be ready or will you be left behind? That's something you have to take a personal examination of your heart to see where you are because he's coming back. It said the Feast of Weeks celebrated the end of the grain harvest. Most interesting, however, is used in Joel and Acts, in, in, in Acts looking back to Joel's prophecy and forward to the promise of the Holy Spirit in Christ's last words on the earth before his ascension into heaven. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 in the English Standard Version. But you will receive power that's dunamis, dynamite, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this is a prophecy that Joel was talking about in the book of Joel chapter 2, the scripture we just read about the outpouring. This is significant of that same outpouring he was talking about. Even Jesus referenced the same, same, same thing when he told disciples to tarry in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. So this is what it's, it's talking about. Then it goes on and says, <clears throat> For to the promise of the Holy Spirit in Christ left forth on earth before the ascension of heaven. Pentecost signals the beginning of the church age, because age, church age, because it was 50 days after the Passover when God allowed the, the deaf angels to sweep through Israel and attack the different families to kill the firstborn of every male child. So 50 days after that was a celebration, the Passover, because God passed over and he covered his people with his presence to keep them from dying. Then Jesus comes along. So 50 days after Christ rose from the dead, the same thing is referenced to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The 50 days after Christ had already risen, because the Bible talks about even when Christ rose from the dead, he lingered around 40 days. So 10 days after that, the outpouring was promised upon the disciples. So when Christ ascended back to glory, before he ascended, he told the disciples, tarry ye in Jerusalem, and you shall be endued with power from on high. So this is what, what took place. On the biblical reference to the actual event, Pentecost, chapter Acts 1 through 3, and so when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided the tongue, divided and divided tongues as a fire appeared. Glory to God. And rested on each one of them. And that's in the English Standard Version. But if you go to King James, it says it like this. And it says, And suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as of fire, and set upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them utterance. So I was listening to T.D. Jakes about tomorrow belongs to the Lord, and he referenced to the different languages. How at one point, when the people of God, they were together in one language, that's when they began to build the Tower of Babel. So as they begin to build the Tower of Babel, God says these people, they're unstoppable because they came together with one mind and one purpose to build this tower to reach heaven. And God says, let us go down. And this is the Holy Spirit said to the Father and the Son, let us go down and confound their language so the language will disperse. That's why you have different languages in the world. So because of the dispersing of the languages, the people didn't understand each other, so they stopped building the tower. That was the, all the plan of God the whole plan of God, to stop them from doing what they were doing because they had the wrong motive and wrong intention for building a tower to reach heaven. So then, not only that, after that incident, years later, when the outpouring of the Spirit came upon disciples, they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. So they understood each other during this time. When the Spirit came upon them, they, they had a revelation and therefore, they all were filled with the Holy Ghost to begin to speak in unknown tongues, and they all understood each other. So that's what God bringing people back together, one accord, to build the church. And that's when the beginning of the church age began to take place, because after the day of Pentecost, God added 3,000 souls to the church. That is so awesome. Pentecost is the reminiscence of the Last Supper. In both instances, the disciples are, are together in the house for what proved to be a, uh, an important event. At the Last Supper, disciples witnessed the end of the Messiah, earthly ministry, as he asked them to remember him after his death until he returns. So remember when Jesus set out in, in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 11, when he, he did the, uh, the Last Supper, he began to sit down, talk to the disciples, he broke bread, he lifted it, prayed over it, broke bread, gave his disciples to eat. He said, this is my body that broken for you. Then he, he said, took the cup, lifted it up, prayed over it, gave it to the disciples, let them drink. 
So this do this remember me that this is the new covenant of my blood that's poured out for you. So because of Jesus' love for the disciples, he told them, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to pray that he send you another comforter. And when the Holy Ghost comes, you will be endued with power from on high, that dynamite power to destroy the power of the enemy. Because in, in Luke 10, 19, he told them, when he was with them, before he sent them out two by two, he says, you know what? I give you power to train on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. So nothing shall by any means hurt you because of the power that I've given to you at your exposal. So you have the power already in you, but a lot of church people don't know how to use this power. So at the Last Supper, he told them, remember them. Remember him after his death until the return. And at Pentecost, disciples witnessed the birth of the New Testament church and coming of the Holy Spirit and indwell in all believers. So on the day of Pentecost, now it gave us access to reach heaven to receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit's power. See, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit hovered among the people of God. He would come upon them. They would prophesy. They would do miracles, signs, and wonders, but they did not have the power living in them. So the Spirit would come upon them, and then he would leave. But in, after the death, burial, resurrection, now the power of the Holy Spirit dwells in us so we can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We can speak to the dead, command them to live. We can unstop deaf ears. We can open blinded eyes. We can call people who are sick with palsy to be made whole. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit lives in us now. So at Pentecost, disciples with the new birth of the church. Thus, the same disciples in the room at Pentecost links the commencement of the Holy Spirit work in the church with the conclusion of Christ's earthly ministry in the upper room before the crucifixion. So they were already gathered in one place, disciples, waiting on the power of the Holy Spirit. So after the crucifixion, that's when the Holy Spirit was being released. The description of fire and wind mentioned in Pentecost recount, is account resounds throughout the Old and New Testament. The sound of the wind at the Pentecost was rushing and mighty. Spiritual reference to the power of wind always understood to be under God's control, abounded. Then, in Exodus chapter 10, verse 13, is a reference scripture. You can write that down. You write the scriptures down. Exodus chapter 10, verse 13. says, So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought forth the east wind upon the land, all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. So this when God was doing a different, different signs and wonders to get Pharaoh's attention. I'm commanding you to let my people go. But Pharaoh being stubborn and being hard and hearted, God had to prove to him that I'm in control. That's why it says the wind is under God's control. It's not under our control. It's under God's control. The wind also, also represents life. When God breathed upon mankind, he breathed into them the breath of life, and man became a living soul in the Garden of Eden. Then not only that, in the Valley of Dry Bones, God told Ezekiel, prophesy to the winds in the four corners, command the wind to blow upon the bones in the valley. And it says, then the bone began, bones began to rumble in the valley, and life and sinew and flesh, the flesh came upon the bone, and God breathed the breath of life into man again. So the, then the army, they came from like a mighty army because God spoke a word through the prophet Ezekiel and they were able to live again. So even in a dead state of mind, a dead, dead state of heart, where we, where many of us are today without the absence of Christ, God has the ability and the power to breathe upon you the word of God and the word of God can cause a shaking, a rumbling in the valley of your heart. And cause a quickening. Quicken means to make alive. To cause you to come alive in the presence of the Lord. God has the power to set you free only if you have a desire to want to be set free. One thing about God, God is not going to force himself on you. He's not going to force you to be obedient to his will. He's not going to force you to change your life. He's not going to force you to stop sinning, stop messing up, stop doing things you know is not right. He's not going to force you. 
He gives you the desire and the will that you have in your own power to control. When you have a desire to want to stop doing what you're doing, you have the will in your heart to want God to come into your life, to change your mind, change your heart. Guess what? He does it. So many church folks are still stuck in the darkness in their minds. They're evil. They're bitter. They, they Every so often, they find themselves having bipolar by the enemy. And I'm not talking about those who are sick with bipolar. I'm talking about those who are spiritually bipolar. Because you have spiritual bipolar people in the body of Christ who knows the word of God, but they keep on playing in the devil's pig pen and the devil keep on causing them to wreak havoc in their lives and lives of other people because they have not come to true conviction and allow the Holy Spirit to change their life. You have to have a desire for God to change you. You have to have a desire for God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, to cleanse you. Jesus told his disciples, he said, you are cleansed by the words that I have spoken unto you. If Jesus has the ability to speak before the crucifixion, the word of God to cleanse you and heal you and deliver you, guess how much greater it is after the resurrection? The power even more greater. He called it a dynamite power. If you know about dynamite, dynamite does what? It explodes whatever's in its perimeter. So whatever in the way of dynamite, when it's about to explode, you better run because it's going to get on you. The Holy Spirit is like dynamite power. He's going to get on you when you are in the way. Just like when Saul, I, I love the story of Saul, reading about Saul and David, because one thing about Saul, Saul was anointed to be king, but Saul, when he disobeyed God, rebelled against God for doing what God told him to do, God stripped him of his, his anointing, and he gave the anointing to David to be the next king. And because of that, an evil spirit came upon Saul, and David would calm his spirit by playing music. So music, certain types of music, has the, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit to calm your spirit. And so as he did this, Saul sought many times to kill David. But David never gave in to the influence of retaliating against him. He allowed vengeance to be in the hands of the Lord. So the same anointing that was on Saul rested upon David. And when the time came for God to reveal David as the next king, Saul was full with rage and jealousy. And that's how people are. When you begin to walk in your purpose, walk in your calling, you're going to find so many different people jealous and hating on you. They're going to backbite against you. They're going to stab you in your back. They're going to talk about you. They're going to degrade your character. They're going to slander you. They're going to do everything in their power to try to stop you from being who you are. But when you have a stern, strong conviction of what God called you to do in your life, it doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter how they mistreat me. It doesn't matter what they talk, talk about me about. No matter what, they, what rumor they spread about me. Because I'm going to stand on the word of God on the conviction that God called me and I'm going to walk worthy of my vocation, which I've been called, which is my job, my calling in God. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 15. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 15. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongues of the sea of Egypt and will wave his hand over the rivers with his scorching breath, wind, and strike it into seven channels. And he would lead the people across in sandals. And this is what God was talking about when he's bringing deliverance to the children of Israel from Egypt. He was going to part the waters. It was prophecy spoken even after Exodus. This was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, who, did, who, who received the revelation from the Spirit of God. And he spoke according to what God had him to speak. And that's what caused him to begin to prophesy because he had the Holy Spirit upon him. He didn't have the spirit living in him. It was upon him. And that's what many prophets of old, they did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit like we have today. They had the Holy Spirit would come upon a season and begin to fall upon them. They begin to speak by the utterance of the Holy Spirit where God wanted to speak to change people's lives, even bring judgment upon people. One thing about God's word, God's word is not going to return to him void. His word has been proven, it's been tested, it's been tried, and been proven sure. And anything you got to speak, he's going to perform it in your life. In the Old Testament, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 32, 23 to 32, Matthew chapter 14, verse 23 to 32, it talks about the same thing about the wind. So it says, and after he had dismissed the crowd, 
he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when the evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was long away from the land beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of night, he came to them walking on the sea. This is talking about the power of Jesus that he had within him. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, is it a ghost? And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Why? Jesus defiled the elements because he was Lord over the elements. He did not allow the winds and the storms, the waves, he didn't, have, didn't allow anything to prevent him to get into his disciples in the boat. And Peter answered, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you a little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Jesus was so powerful, so awesome, so extraordinary. So even when he commanded the disciples to go to the other side of the sea while he was in the midst of praying, he still had the power to meet his disciples by walking on the water to find the elements. We cannot walk on water like a, we can't go out to the, to the um, Michigan Lake and decide I'm going to walk out on the water. That ain't going to work. We're not designed to walk on water. Because of Jesus was Lord over the elements, he had the ability to do whatever he trusted the Father for him to do. And he did it. So, he, so Peter said, Lord, if it's you, and this is, I read in the English Standard Version. So Peter said, Lord, if it's you, then allow me to come to you. And he said, come. And many times the Lord would defile you in your mindset because we're stuck trying to reason with our natural minds what God is doing in the spirit realm. You cannot fathom the things of the spirit with the mindset of the flesh. The mind of the flesh will never, ever comprehend the things of the spirit until they spiritually discern or reveal to you by the Holy Spirit. So you got to get in your word. You got to get in a place of prayer. You got to seek, seek God for yourself and know that with God, you can do all things in Christ who strengthens you. Then goes on and says, more significant than wind as power is wind as life in the Old Testament. In Job chapter 12, verse 10, Job says, in Job chapter 12, verse 10, in the English Standard Version, he says, in his hands is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Because our lives cannot exist without the Spirit of God living inside of us. Without the Spirit of God, you're a dead man walking. Without the Spirit of God, you're a dead woman walking. Without the Spirit of God, you're a dead child living. Why? Because the Spirit gives life and it quickens you. But the flesh brings you to death. In St. John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, The wind bloweth where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We just talked about this last week about being born of the Spirit. When Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, You must be born of the water and of the Spirit in order to enter to the kingdom of heaven. Until you go through the new birth process, the washing of the water of the word, receiving the renewal by the spirit with the new life, you're still a dead man living. The idea of spiritual life as generated by the Holy Spirit is certainly implicit in the, second, in, in the sound of the wind at Pentecost. So it's significant to the wind at Pentecost, the same sound of the wind. Fire is often associated in the Old Testament with the presence of God. Fire is often associated in the Old Testament with the presence of God. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, in the English Standard Version, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame out of fire in the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And this was the encounter with Moses. When he was living with his father-in-law in, in, the, in the wilderness, he was living with his father-in-law, and he saw this fire burning on a bush, and something on the inside of him said, turn, let me go see this sight to see what this is, which was God's way of getting his attention because God had a plan for his life to change his life forever. 
If you know the story of Moses, Moses was a murderer. He killed an Egyptian because he was defending one of his own people that were Gentiles. And so because of this, he, was, he ran for his life and he hid among his own people. And God said, you know what? It's all in my plan because I still have a plan for him to use him to deliver my people. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 and 22. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 through 22. And it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and, and, and lead to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not be part before, <coughs> before the... Uh, Excuse me. The pillar of fire, he said, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart before the people. So, because of God's goodness, the fire, God protected his people even after he delivered them out of Egypt. Yet they still were faced with an encounter of Pharaoh pursuing them to take their lives again. And God said, you know what? I got something for them. I'm going to protect my people. So, I'm going to put a pillar of cloud to lead them by the way of the Red Sea. And then he says, I'm going to put a fire uh, uh, by night to, to lead and guide them at nighttime because they can't see. Even God did the same pillar of fire when the Egyptians came to try to pursue them and take their lives. God still protected them by fire. And it was, it was an indication the fire of God still goes before us today because the fire now dwells in us, which is God's presence. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 17. The light of Israel become a fire and the Holy One a flame. And it will burn and devour his thorns and briars one day. And this is reference to Christ coming and about the enemy to arise against them. And with holiness. Likewise, in the New Testament, fire is associated with the presence of God and the purification he can bring about the human life. God's presence, God's presence and holiness are implied in the Pentecostal tongues of fire. Indeed, fire is identified with Christ himself. This association naturally underlies, underlies the Pentecost gift of the Holy Spirit who would teach his disciples the things of Christ. Remember Jesus. He told his disciples. He says, you know what? I'm going to pray God see another comforter. He will guide you in all truth and bring back to you remembrance the things which I have commanded you. So in other words, they're going to, the Holy Spirit is going to remind you as the fire come upon you, of what I have taught you and how to live in this life as a witness for me. So John 16, verse 14, St. John 16, verse 14, said, He will glorify me, and he will take what is mine and declare to you. So God glorified Jesus to the point of death when God he was saying the same glory with the same fire that's inside of me, God's going to take what is mine and give it to you. So the day of Pentecost was a representation of the outpouring of transformation of the Holy Spirit from Jesus Christ to God's people today. Another aspect of the day of Pentecost is the miraculous speaking in foreign tongues, which enabled the people from various languages, groups, to understand the message of the apostles. So this is where God brought the diverse of tongues to the people of God to, the, to let the people know that in any different language that they were natives of, that now you have the right to have an understanding of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and get a revelation of the gospel message that's preached to all mankind. That is so awesome. Ooh, that's glory. Glory to God in the higher. Glory to God. So it enables people from various languages and groups to understand the message of the apostles. In addition, it, it is the bold and indecisive, incisive the bold, incisive preaching of Peter to the Jewish audience because the gospel was first sent to the Jews, then afterward the Greeks, which were the Gentiles. So the gospel message was first originally designed to go to, to the Jews. It wasn't designed for the Gentiles. But because of the engrafted covenant of Abraham that we were entitled to, when Christ rose from the dead, he entitled all of us now the right to receive the gospel message which can change all of our lives. That is so awesome. The effect of the sermon was powerful as the listeners were cut to heart. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. I'm going to read it in King James. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. And it says, 
Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the fire, the dunamis power. So after the day of Pentecost, this was, was now able to give to anybody who come to salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the, in the uh, New Living Translation, it says, after they heard this, they were cut to their hearts. So when God pricked the heart, that means he brought conviction to the heart. And the convicting power of the Holy Spirit now made people want to find out what's the next step of the process. Now you done preached the gospel message to me. Now what must I do to be saved? Repent. The same message being preached to us today. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And that baptism is not just the water baptism. True enough, we must be baptized as an outward expression of changing the old nature to the new nature, but most of all being baptized in the Holy Ghost to receive the power of the Holy Ghost to be a witness for the Lord. The wonders and the community in which everyone needs were met. And because of this, says the narrative concludes with 3,000 souls being added to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer and the apostolic signs and wonders and a community which what everyone needs were met. So because of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, God added 3,000 souls to the church. And the most significant thing about that passage of scripture is that everyone took what they had and brought their arms, which was their money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And the apostles, by the power of the Holy Spirit, distributed everything they were given to help everybody who had a need. That is so awesome. That is so awesome. We would be a great church today if the church would do the same thing instead of caring about themselves. You got a lot of pastors, a lot of bishops, a lot of apostles, about a lot of uh, uh, folk in high dignitary positions who don't care nothing about helping other people. They only care what you can give to me to build my church. They only care what you can give to me to build my, my house, to make my pockets fat. I can care less about what you have a need of. You, you have to give me. So they teach these condemning messages about giving to bring you to condemnation, to make you feel guilty and compulsive to, to give what you got. And it shouldn't be that way. Because the Bible says God wants us to give out of our own heart, not grudgingly or necessity of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So whatever I have to give to bless God's man of God or bless his ministry, I give by the power of the Holy Spirit what God tells me to give, and I'm not going to let nobody put me in condemnation about giving. That's why when I ask for seeds for this ministry, it's not about me. It's about promoting God's kingdom. Because when you sow your seed, you've given what God, it may be a dollar. It doesn't matter to me what the amount is. If God says all you have, to like the widow, when she came to present her offering to the Lord, and, and the Pharisee came, and he gave what he had, and, the, and, the, and the, this widow gave all she had was two mice, Jesus asked the disciple, who gave the most? And he, and he, and he said, the, the disciple said, the Pharisee. He said, no. He said, this widow has given everything she has. So she gave the most because she gave to the Lord all she had from her heart. When you give to the Lord out of your heart, that's what pleases God. It's the obedience that God is looking for. It's not about the amount God's looking for. And you know what? Every time for the last several years, God had me so in people's lives, I do it. I do it out of the purpose of my heart to glorify God, whether I get a return or not from it. Because it's not about me. I love to give because God blessed me so much all the time. When I have a need, I pray about it. Lord, I thank you for the provision. I thank you for the favor. I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Father God, to touch lives, change hearts. Father, everything you have me do, I do to the glory of God. And I said, you give it to me, Father. I give it to you in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord God, that I live in the overflow, that my barns are filled with plenty, my vats flow with the, with the new wine. Father, as I give, it come back to me good measures, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give them to my bosom. And guess what? It happens every time. Why? Because I operate in the faith of the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a difference 
than just giving in church or to some organization to help the needy. And when you give under the unction of the Holy Spirit, it has an impact to reach heaven and cause God to open up the windows of heaven and to pour right back into your life just what you've been praying for. Somebody, somebody might need uh, their marriage restored. Somebody need, 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 that, need a new job. You might need your car fixed. You might need your refrigerator fixed. You might need food in your house. Your children are starving. It doesn't matter what that need is. God says, when you give to me, you even give your time. It's giving. If you don't have a dime to give, you give your time just like people on here each week, giving their time to hear this word. You're blessing God's heart by your obedience. But that's why I love teaching the word of God because it's not about me. It's about God getting the glory. And when God gets the glory, guess what? He releases the blessings into my life. It may be a blessing of just giving somebody a kind word. It might be a blessing by giving me a kind word. Somebody may do something. I don't have a car. Somebody may say, hey, you need a ride to the store? And they come along and say, you know what? I'm going to give you a ride. You know, because you, 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 you're a wonderful person and, and everything you're doing, you're always helping people. Why? Because that's what we're supposed to do as servants of the Most High God. You and I are servants. Pastors are servants. Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom is the servant. And when you serve God's people, God says, you know what? I'm going to serve you. I'm going to go into my bank account. I'm going to release the, the, one, the blessings of heaven to allow them to pour upon you. Did you have room enough to receive? Why? Because the obedience. Amen. Amen. So, the narrative concludes that with 3,000 souls added to the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer, the apostolic signs and wonders, that means the healings, the miracles that they did to set people free and the community to meet everyone's needs. And that's what God does for us today. When we walk in obedience, God, you know what? I got you. So the Holy Spirit and power after the day, after Pentecost day. As we talked about in the beginning, Pentecost means 50. So 50 days after Christ rose from the dead, this is what God did. Had the disciples meet, as he said, in Jerusalem, in the upper room, waiting on the power of the Holy Spirit. The disciples received the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit separately, since the Holy Spirit was not yet released to them by the time they received the Spirit of Christ. So they received the Spirit of Christ. It said after the Pentecost day, people received the Spirit as they received the Holy Spirit. Once the message of salvation inspires faith in the hearers, he must receive the Spirit of Christ by the laying on of hands, breath, and in the most instances, a symbolic baptism. The symbolic baptism is something done as sprinkling of water on a person's head for the idea of receiving the Holy Spirit. See how, how the water ties in with the Holy Spirit? Even the baptism is significant to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Receiving the Spirit automatically brings the Holy Spirit just as receiving the Holy Spirit makes one receive the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of, of the Son. So when Christ was in the room with the disciples after the resurrection, it says he breathed on them and said, so receive the Holy Spirit. And guess what? They received his Spirit on that day, but they didn't receive the outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost. Because after they received the, Jesus' Spirit and the Spirit of the Son, the Spirit of Christ, they didn't receive the power until the day of Pentecost. However this may be done, it should be an understanding of receiving either the Spirit of Christ or the Holy Spirit. It is a package now. Nevertheless, it is necessary to know the Spirit of adoption is not the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of adoption, because we're born in Christ, is not the Spirit of adoption that's going to give you the Holy Spirit. Some wrongly think the new Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Your new Spirit is your new nature, your new identity. When you, when you get to a place of repentance and you give your heart to Jesus Christ, you receive the new spirit. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. All things are passed away. The old nature, the old spirit are passed away. And behold, all things become new. The new spirit of Christ comes in you. And the same spirit dwells in you. And then with the laying of hands, believing and receiving the Holy Spirit, then you receive the power of the Holy Spirit by the baptism. It confirms it. 
However, he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will guide you in all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but who, whosoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. That's St. John chapter 16, verse 13. St. John chapter 16, verse 13. So when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to guide you in all truth. And he's going to speak not of himself. In other words, not going to boast about himself. He's going to talk about everything that Jesus talked to his disciples about and tell you what you need to do about your life today. St. John 15, verse 26. St. John 15, verse 26. It says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, would proceed is from the Father, he shall testify of me. So Jesus made it clear that when the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, comes, who the Father will send, as he rose from the dead, ascended back to the Father, he said, the Father is going to send you the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father and shall testify of what he done for us. And that is so awesome to know that the Holy Spirit testifies of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism. Being a human being means you are counted as part of that kind. As such, the Spirit of Christ makes you part of the heavenly kind called the Son of God. The Spirit of Christ makes you part of the heavenly kind called the Son of God, which is of the new nature. The baptism of the Holy Spirit makes you part of the body of Christ. He is the linking factor. So when you're born again, you receive the Spirit of Christ. But when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, you receive the power of the body of Christ, which connects you together as one union in Christ. Receiving a package from the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit is in your conclusion, is in your inclusion. So it's in the package deal. It's for you. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. So at the new birth, the new nature, being for the Holy Spirit, the, the separation, when Jesus died on the cross, said the veil was rent in the temple from the top to the bottom, which brought the union that divided the people of God, the Jews and the Gentiles, from living together, dwelling among each other. It was broken by the power of God to bring now that was separated now together. That's what it said, neither bind nor free. We were all made to drink into one spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. For through him, we both have access to, by one spirit unto the Father. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. For through him, him who? Christ. We both have access by one spirit. Not many spirits. You go to different cultures, begin to search different cultures up. On Google or, uh, uh, or the other thing, Edge, Edge uh, 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 browser, you'll find out there are many different types of religions, different types of spirits that people worship. But there's only one spirit that connects us to God, and that's the Holy Spirit. And we have to be willing, after being born again, to allow the Spirit of God to come and change our minds, change our lives, change our hearts. A cause to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Anyone born of water and of the Spirit is recognized as part of the body of Christ and the Son of God. That is so awesome. Anyone that is born of the water and of the Spirit is recognized, is identified as a new believer, a child of God, one who's born again and is part of of the body of Christ and the Son of God. So we're going to end on this note tonight. But I encourage you, if you don't have this book, get this book, Incorruptible, The Realm of the Mind. It's a really great book to study. Great book. And I tell you, when you get this book, 
It's going to enlighten you. It's going to open your eyes. It's going to give you revelation. Because it, it gives you a lot of great information about the realm of the mind. And it's by um, Isaac Elsilfi. Isaac Elsilfi, which is E S S I L F I E. E S S I L F I E. Isaac Elsilfi. And I tell you, this book is an eye-opening tool that God allowed him to write for God's people today. And I tell you, when you get into this book, and you read this book, you get understanding from this book, it shows you who you really are in Christ. And how you, when you're walking separated from Christ, it, it opens your eyes to see where you are in your faith in God. And many people are, are still lost in the body of Christ. They're going to church over 50, 40 years and still have not come to Revelation who they are in Christ Jesus. But I come to tell you tonight, when you get the revelation who God is to you, it's going to set you free. It's going to change your mind, change your life, and change your heart. So, Lord God, tonight I thank you for this word concerning Pentecost, concerning the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I pray, oh God, that he helps set somebody free in their inner man tonight, even brought conviction to many that needs convicting in their hearts tonight, oh God, that will show them where they are walking in truth and righteousness or they're walking as an alien and stranger against Christ. Allow the word of God to prick all of our hearts, to cut us, to bring us to the place, oh God, that we want to live right for you. We want to serve you with a new mind, a new heart, a new spirit, to walk by faith and not by sight in the promise of your word. And then, Lord God, I speak healing and deliverance over everyone who hears this word, Father God, who may be bound with an addiction, with a habit, with a stronghold, Father, falling out the line of the enemy and not following your truth, that you draw them back to you, God, by the compelling power of the Holy Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you continue to cause us to grow in grace and the knowledge of who you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be on tonight and don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You even may be a backslider. I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. If you know you're not living right with God, or you're a backslider, tipping and dipping in sin, why don't you pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And I thank you, Lord God, for giving me another chance to come to you and repent. Tonight, God, I ask you to forgive me for my sins. Knowingly and unknowingly, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb, and I thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, it's a guarantee that you now have been born again by the Spirit of the living God, and you now entitled to the precious promise of God's Word to walk in the fullness of who He is, no matter what you go through in this life, knowing with confidence and boldness that greatest is in you than he that's in the world. And, and allow the Spirit of God to continue to draw you to that place in him where nothing else in this world will matter but you serving God with a new mind, a new heart every day. Continue to walk in your purpose, for your purpose. Be the change you want to be as we walk by faith and not by sight in the promise of God's word. Until next week, Ray out just a second. I want to post this link. If you want to sow a donation into the ministry, feel free to do so. And every seed goes right back into the ministry, even for materials that God gave me to get to help teach his people. So, Lord God, I thank you for this word. I thank you, O God, for another opportunity. Lord, and now may the grace of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest upon all of our hearts until we meet again. Give those traveling grace who may be traveling to work or any other place tonight, oh God, to make it back to their destination safely. Cover them in the blood of Jesus. Protect them from danger, seeing unseen, from every attack and onslaught of the enemy to try to come against the God. Even when they lie down to sleep, oh God, let their sleep be peaceful, Lord God. They will not have disturbing dreams that would, Father, disrupt their rest, oh God. But you said, Father, children of Israel fell to enter your rest because of unbelief. And God, we believe tonight, God, that when we lie down, our sleep shall be peaceful and sweet, O oh God, in the presence of the Lord. We ask that you be glorified and exalted until we meet again. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May the Lord be gracious to you and, and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Have a good night, everybody. Again, I thank everyone for coming on tonight. Love you all, and God loves you too. And it's an awesome blessing and a privilege to see many of you on tonight. God bless you, uh, uh, Sister Jennifer. Thank you. God bless you for joining tonight. I, I, I thank you all again for your weekly support. Those of you who've been faithfully coming on to this, this uh, Bible study every Tuesday. I pray that you're being enriched by the word. I pray that you're being strengthened by the word. I thank, pray you're being encouraged by the word. And that you're allowing God to change your life every day for the better. Until next week, shalom, peace be unto you in the name of the Lord. Before I go, if you got any questions that anyone would like to ask me, feel free to do so. Or inbox me your question, and I will give you the answer according to what God gives me. Amen. So if anyone have a question, you can feel free to write your question at this moment if you would like. Otherwise, just inbox me at uh, Charles B. Emery, and I will answer your question according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Well, amen. Praise the Lord. Until next week, you all be blessed. Amen. Have a good night. Amen. God bless you, Lily. Amen. Hallelujah.